Alina. And I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary My Dear. Where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. Today, we're talking all about food allergies. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss one of our videos. So when I went to school, I remember there were so, so many kids, like every year that had food allergies. I don't know, was that the same for you? It really wasn't. And I don't know if that's reflective of our age difference or okay. just the school that I went to or what. Because you hear a lot now about like a lot of restrictions of what kids can bring I to know. school. And even like products will say on it like, like safe for school. Safe for school or like whatever school approved yeah. or something like that. Uh, but I didn't, I mean, I don't know if I was just like ignorant to it but yeah. I don't think it was like us talked about when I was going to like okay. elementary school and stuff we weren't allowed to bring peanuts to school or yeah. peanut butter and peanut butter is like the most easy lunch to make like a peanut butter sandwich it's a classic exactly. it's a childhood classic so like even in terms of like seasonal allergies you didn't really hear that ever. no and I definitely get seasoned I, I I'm pretty sure I'm allergic to flowers because like even like when I'm just like walking outside and stuff like oh. if I walk past a house with like a beautiful garden like I'll immediately start sneezing which is really upsetting because yeah. I enjoy looking at flowers but they don't they don't like me back can you have flowers in your house no no I remember like my, my partner's gotten me flowers before and like there'd be like a week straight where I'd be like sneezing non-stop and he's the one that pointed it out to me he's like you know I feel like there might be a connection that is so funny oh so, well you're just my now, now. Yeah, now he's off the hook Hug, yeah forever getting me flowers you know, why do you never buy me flowers like, well because I'm doing it for you babe yeah, yeah allergies they seem to be coming like more and more pro, pro Prevalent. Prevalent. <laughs> I'm lactose intolerant, mm -hmm. but I'm not allergic to anything. And I'm really happy about that because I'm like the worst lactose intolerant person on the planet. Yeah, you uh, don't say no to dairy no. very often. <laughs> no, I don't. So if I had like a milk allergy, I think I would be dead. Before we get into the nutrition part of allergies, we should have to talk about like what are allergies what constitutes an allergy? So allergies are basically when your body kind of freaks out for no reason. It's typically something that's not actually harmful, but your body thinks that it's harmful and kind of triggers your immune re response to attack this substance that's entered your body. And it's typically the protein component of the food that your body for some reason thinks is like a foreign invader and kind of like mobilizes all the forces to like get rid of it and attack it. You know, your immune system is looking out for your best interests most of the time, but allergies is one of the cases where they go in a little bit too gung-ho and it can lead to like some really serious things. Like people can die from allergies. If you have an anaphylactic allergy, your throat can close and you can die. Um, but even the discomfort of having like swollen, mm -hmm things, rashes, hives, doesn't sound great. Your body's... Actually, now that you mentioned hives, I might have a food allergy, actually. I, I, ran, I don't know, I randomly break out in hives, like, and there's no rhyme or reason to mm -hmm. it, or at least I haven't picked up on any, like, theme of, okay. like, an ingredient or a food item, but, like, sometimes I'll randomly get hives, like, on my arms or on my face or neck, and, oh. and then it just, like, goes away, and it, it never seemed like to be like a big enough issue for me to investigate yeah so i never have like keep a di diary that's what i always tell should. people like yeah. when i have like digestive problems with yeah. the diaries they can figure out what it is right you know i think i might be a little bit allergic to kiwis oh, okay because every time i eat kiwis my tongue like really yeah. feels weird the good thing about kiwi like i think i like kiwis but i could live without kiwis you know you haven't had a golden kiwi. No, I have had a golden. No, those okay. are really good. Those are really good. But I mean, compared to like mangoes and pineapples and grapes, I love grapes. I, I could say... overeat on grapes so easily. So we just mentioned fruit, which is actually one of the common global allergens, as is nuts, tree nuts. Surprisingly to me, is rice mm. that is on that list. What's weird about rice is that, like, I think on a global scale, it's not that common, but it seems to happen more often in, like, East Asian countries, like China and Japan. Uh, Chinese and Japanese food that I've been exposed to, I'm like, how do you get on in, you know, China and Japan with a rice allergy? Absolutely. And it sounds like it's the more exposure there is, the higher the risk of having an allergy. And that's kind of the thought, which... To me, it feels a little counterintuitive, actually, but mm -hmm. we notice that in other parts of the world, too. For example, Greece and peanut allergies. Mm -hmm. There's almost no peanut allergies in Greece, 
because uh, apparently peanut consumption is not that common there. But then, I, you think that it would be a higher prevalence. I know. I know. It's, to me, it feels a little counterintuitive, but it seems like there's something there. There's a lot of regional variability when it comes to what people are allergic to. And I think like, that kind of shows like the environmental impact on allergies. Interestingly, there are two types of food allergies, and the main one is called IgE-mediated. So that's basically immunoglobin E-mediated. So we have a bunch of different immunoglobin-related immune responses, and the E type is typically actually reserved for you know fighting off parasites, but we also see it activated when it comes to things like food allergies. Yeah, and just to highlight exactly like what an I G or an immunoglobulin is, um, it is part of your immune system. And so, for example, when people are getting the COVID vaccine, what that does is help build up your IgGs, so your immunoglobulin Gs, and those are the ones that go attack like viruses and bacteria, so that it can go, like, you know, it detects COVID, it can get it right at the source because it's already used to it. But then for some reason, with food allergies, it's using that Ig. E response. There is another type of allergy, which is a non-IgE mediated allergy. So basically that long name just means it's, it, the way it happens is not related to that immunoglobulin E that we just talked about. It's actually thought to also be from your immune system, but from a different type of immune cell called the T cell. So the T cell recognizes this foreign thing or this thing that shouldn't be, shouldn't be there and it goes and attacks it. And what this produces are mostly gastrointestinal kind of responses. So things like diarrhea, vomiting, um, abdominal pain and things like that. Um, so you, these are not as like life threatening, but they can be very, very, very uh, uncomfortable. And we both know someone who I'm, per I don't know if it's a, if it's a non IgE allergy to a protein that's in dairy, but it was really, really bad. Um, and so it can be mm -hmm. like, even though there's not that like anaphylaxis risk, it can be quite, you know, the debilitating and, and bad. But for that one, they mostly just recommend that you um, avoid that food. So you don't need like an EpiPen or anything like that, like you would need in uh, some types of IgE mediated ones. There's no like real treatment really for mm -hmm. that. It's more about just abstaining from eating that food. And it is possible to have both types of allergies concurrently, like at the same time, like the IgE and the non-IgE mediated. So now who, what kind of people tend to have allergies? We well, do see some common themes. Mm -hmm, for sure. And like, I think that most people uh, kind of know this because, you know, we talk about allergies about like foods going to school, but younger people tend to have allergies. You hear people growing out of allergies as mm -hmm. they get older. Um, so like I have a friend who has like a lot of allergies and he's gotten like retested like a few times and like some of them have gone away. And some oh, that's awesome. Stuck. Yeah. And can you imagine like your whole life you never got to eat like sesame maybe? Okay, sesame might be less life changing for some people. Yeah, I think something like nuts, I think, might yeah. be more life changing. But I've heard though, people with allergies, like it's all, I, I don't know if there's like evidence behind this, but just anecdotally from people I know and other people, they don't actually like the taste of the foods that they're allergic to. Interesting. So I don't know if it's like there's some protective mechanism there. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Or do you think it's just like lack of exposure? Yeah. To I don't know, but I wonder when you think about, well, I guess it depends on what it is, but I feel like a lot of kids may, might not even like something like yeah. nuts or something or like fish, fish or, or eggs yeah. and maybe it's something that you kind of grow to like as you get older, especially okay. fish. Yeah. But peanut butter, kids love peanut butter. That's true. That's true. But I've heard people say like they just like, even the smell, this really turns them off. Oh, so okay. there must be something protective did. there. Yeah. So That's I so wonder, so if you grow out of it, would that kind of disgust response go away but I also wonder if it's like maybe they had an exposure that led to them getting really ill and then they now associate that food with that and that's what leads to the disgust response. Because you hear about that with food poisoning exactly. as well. Your your brain kind of just makes that association, association and you kind of feel repellent, like it feels repulsive when, you, when you're exposed to that food in the future. Even if that food may not have, have actually been, been the cause of your food poisoning. Yeah. If you're allergic and you have a disgust response to the food you're allergic to, or have outgrown your allergy, we'd love to hear your experience with that. 
There's also thought to be maybe a hereditary component of allergies because, you know, people that have family members that have allergies, they're more likely to develop that allergy as well. So as we get more into it, we'll talk about some of the environmental components. So I wonder if it's hereditary or maybe just like that same environment. Same environment. Absolutely. Or maybe it's both. Who knows? Like most things, most it's things. always it's really a always bit of nature, nature and nurture. nurture. We also see people who have other food allergies are more likely to develop other food allergies. It's just like putting salt on the wound, wound isn't it? Imagine. I wonder what that is. I've heard sometimes, you know, those skin prick tests, which is one of the ways that they diagnose um, allergies. I'm sure anyone who has allergies probably know this, but they like kind of take a little bit of um, the allergen and then prick your skin and see how strong of a response you get on your skin uh, because you know you have immune um, function all throughout your body including on your skin which is why people get hives uh, I've heard sometimes that those are overly sensitive so sometimes they might produce a response on your skin and then um, you wouldn't actually have a reaction if you mm. ate the food and I know after people have like a severe response allergic response they'll go get those done and so sometimes they'll unnecessarily have like okay. a bunch of other things that come up so maybe that's so like that might skew the data a little bit I don't know that's a good point mm -hmm. actually that's very compelling to be honest that makes sense yes. <laughs> people that perhaps have never experienced a reaction may never get tested and mm -hmm. just, it's what seems like they have nothing but then someone that's had one allergic reaction, they're more likely to get tested and then be ex it seems like there's a lot more going on there. And then people with other medical conditions also seem to be more likely to have allergies. Um, so things like asthma or eczema. Which is really, really interesting. And I know that like for babies who have um, eczema, like that's something that like the doctors have to be like alerted for is like, mm -hmm. oh, looking out for food allergies once they get introduced to um you know, uh, more like solids. solids. There we go. Introduce the solids. I should know that. I think a lot of times when you think about food allergies, you know, they might seem, you know, beyond like the short term discomfort or short term kind of symptoms that you see. It might seem like it's relatively benign, you know, as long as you avoid the food. But there are actually like nutritional implications to consider, especially if you are a growing child. You know, people who have food allergies often have to cut out major like food groups, like especially when we look at things like uh, cow milk allergies, mm -hmm. um, like that's a that's a major food group for a lot of people, especially in North America. That's like a major source of many, many vitamins and minerals. And, you know, oftentimes we see in people who have cow milk allergies that they end up with uh, a shorter stature, so they don't grow as tall, also lower bone mil mineral density. And we can even see in some people really extreme um, nutrient deficiencies. Uh, so things like rickets and um, also there's been case reports of children having seizures from low calcium um, in, 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 term, in cases of milk allergies. Yeah, and this isn't to scare any parent that may have a child that, you know, has a milk allergy. It's more to just draw attention that, you know, when we're restricting certain foods, we want to make sure that the nutrients that would typically come from that food are coming from another source. And that's actually a great reason to reach out to a dietitian to kind of get that support. Um, and, you know, even beyond something like a milk allergy with things like tree nut allergies, uh, that's a, a nuts are a common source of potassium for a lot of kids. So just making sure that you're getting that potassium or that your child is getting that potassium from other sources such as, you know, fruits and vegetables or, you know, something to be mindful of as well. Imagine, you know, this, this we're talking about individual allergies, but so many people will have three or four allergies and that really, really restricts the diet. So, you know, if you have an allergy or you have a child who has an allergy, honestly... And then you throw picky eating on there, top of yeah. that. <laughs> Oh, parents of children with allergies, that's definitely tough. Yeah. But yeah, like dietitians are a really, really great um, resource. I know obviously when you speak to your allergenist, allergist, allergist, allergist um, they'll have some good resources for you. But if you work with a dietitian, or a little biased, but if you work with a dietitian, they'll really be able to sit down and take the time and kind of plan things out with how you normally eat. So. Yeah, taking into account your preferences and your eating habits and kind of tailoring recommendations to kind of fit your lifestyle. I think you hear the older generation sometimes mocking the younger generations mm -hmm. um, about how there's a lot of food allergies these days mm -hmm. and it's almost like 
And I was a boy, we were strong and mighty. Yeah. And, and y'all are going to die from a peanut. So you know? people seem to take it as like a commentary on our youth's like weakness or, you know, something like that. Which is, first of all, if... if Who raised us? Exactly. <laughs> who who set up this, word, this environment that we're in that's giving us allergies? Who did yeah, that? We could. I could have a whole rant about that. Yeah. But why we can't afford houses? Who, who, who did that? <laughs> why we're you know staying with our parents till we're thirty five? Who did that? Why we killed the diamond industry because none of us are getting married because we can't afford to? Who did that? But I don't know how we went down this. <laughs> but no, it's definitely something you hear. Is that like I've heard this so many times, even from my mom and her friends. She's like, oh, when we were kids, no one had allergies. Blah 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 blah. And I'm like, well, you raised me, so why do all my friends have allergies? What did you do? Yeah, what, what did, did you, you do? do? And you know, you see global trends. That, like, they it are, is on the rise. It is on the rise. There, like, there is truth to that. Uh, a lot of research has been done, especially in the United States and in Europe. You do see quite a few more admissions for anaphylaxis. So like, that's like the very extreme response. I feel like more people are probably just getting tested too. So I wonder if that's contributing to some of the mm -hmm. increase. There's more awareness of it yeah. and more people are getting tested. Um, but you know, the increase that we've seen since like the 1980s to the 2020s is it can't completely be explained right. by increased awareness and stuff like that, especially when we look at anaphylaxis because the awareness piece, you're aware. I think the general public, you often hear the idea of like, maybe we're too clean now. Mm -hmm. There's an entire formal hypothesis that it, where that idea came from. It's called the hygiene, hygiene hypothesis. hypothesis. And it was basically um, some doctor dude. Do you remember his name? St I know his last name is Strawn. Strawn. David Strawn? That sounds like David it. Strawn. Uh, he noticed that kids with siblings seem to have less things like hay fever and eczema. So he kind of proposed this idea that maybe kids aren't like getting sick enough or like getting like exposure to a bunch of different infections and stuff. And that's what's increasing the risk for getting allergies. That theory got debunked because yes, I guess kids with more siblings got sick more often because kids are disgusting and like grubby and, and probably germy, germy and, and sticky and, 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 and exactly yeah. yeah those are kids can um, you tell that we don't have kids we don't have kids <laughs> they're always getting sick and they're always passing on that illness to other people and the thing is though is to test that hypothesis they actually looked at okay well kids who get sick more often do they have more or less allergies and it actually turns out that kids that get sick more often have more allergies. So the hygiene hypothesis kind of, you know, pivoted a little bit. Pivot! <laughs> Pivot! And now it seems like it's less about getting more sick, but more about just having exposure to different microorganisms. So, you know, even having something like a sibling, you're more likely to be exposed to more microorganisms. Because kids are even <laughs> Because kids are disgusting. So your grubby little sister's like putting her hand in your mouth after she picked her nose. That's more bacteria for you. People with pets actually seem to have less allergies as well. And you can imagine like how dogs, you know, they're like going out, digging around in dirt, sniffing other dogs' butts, and then giving you those loving kisses <laughs> that you love so much. Lots of microorganism transfers mm -hmm. going on there. The environment that we live in right now is not... A, it's kind of artificially clean compared to, you know, when we were developing as a species and um, like all our like micro anti antibacterial stuff and, you know, obviously in the case of COVID, always wash your hands, make sure you're putting your hand sanitizer on, um, make sure you're wiping your things down. But, you know, living in these environments where you're using antibacterial things every single day, is this really not, you know, how we came up as um, as and species and we actually also see that people who live on farms um, have fewer allergies as well and that could also be from exposure to the animals on the farm um, it could be just due to living in a more rural setting so you know having things like siblings and pets or living on a farm can seem to decrease your risk for developing allergies but on the flip side there are some things that might actually increase your likelihood of developing an allergy and one of them is if you were born by a c-section and that actually fits into the hypothesis quite well not going through that vaginal canal actually prevents some exposure to different microorganisms as well we also see people uh, especially infants who have a lot of antibiotics 
um, have a higher risk of developing food allergies and that actually could be because it's killing off all the bacteria that you're exposed to and so yeah. Again, that seems to fit nicely with the the new hygiene Hi hypothesis. Exactly. We don't really know. That's why it's like a hypothesis. But, you know, hypothesis in science is still pretty strong. Like, it's still a pretty strong thing. We just don't know completely. So if you're a parent, you might be wondering what you can do to kind of minimize the risk of your child developing allergies. And there actually are some guidance and recommendations on that. Um, so we'll give you a brief history. Actually, originally, the recommendation was to hold off on giving those priority allergen foods to your kids until the age of three. But that recommendation was unfortunately built on some faulty foundation. Some expert opinion. Which is actually like pretty low on like the hierarchy of evidence. So watch our video on, um, you know, the quality of nutrition evidence. We'll link it in here. I guess it was kind of intuitive. It's like, okay, we're seeing this rise in allergies. Why are we seeing this? People are scared. We don't want more allergies. You know, guys, don't give it to your babies. And I can see how they got there. There just wasn't evidence. But, you know, this is, we can kind of see one of the ways that making recommendations without the evidence to back it up can actually be quite harmful. There's some thought that that recommendation may have actually contributed to the rise in peanut allergies over the last few decades. As we've gotten more data, we've changed the recommendations a couple times. Um, the first one was basically, you know, you don't need to hold off on these foods. I think that was in around 2008 or so. But, you know, the public was already scared of food allergies. Everyone's kid was thought everyone thought their kid was going to eat a peanut and die. I, oh my god, who was telling me this that they drove when they wanted to give their baby or their toddler peanuts the first time, they drove to the sick kids hospital parking lot yeah. and gave it to their kid to make sure that if anything happened they'd be close to the right. hospital. I've actually heard of stories with parents too that especially if they had multiple kids where maybe with the first kid they were explicitly told to like hold off on giving mm -hmm. things like peanuts but then with the second child they were told no no like make sure you're introducing it super early and I think like if when you hear those types of conflicting messages it's kind of scary and confusing it's as very a parent. confusing and it kind of makes sense to me that your instinct might be to stick to the original recommendation of course of and that's more cautious like yeah it seems like it seems like it would be more intuitive and obvious to just hold off on mm -hmm. giving something that your child might be allergic to. So, I mean, I, I feel for those parents that had to kind of deal with that transition period. But yeah, right now the recommendation is to give things like especially peanuts and especially if your child might be considered high risk for a peanut allergy, to give it to them at the four to six month mark when you're introducing other solids. For those higher risk infants, that might be something to discuss with your doctor um, because you know, it, they still want you to give it early, but maybe they want to have some special precautions. Um, things that can make your child high risk is having um, other food allergies or having um, eczema uh, on their body as an infant. For infants that aren't high risk, they even say to introduce peanuts as soon as possible. You know, again, that four to six month range mark. And all the kids who tolerate it well, whether they're high risk or not high risk, keep up that intake like pretty regularly um a couple times a week they they would recommend giving your child a age appropriate peanut food so i would not recommend giving your small baby um whole peanuts but you know a little bit of peanut butter on something might be a, a good option um just to uh you know keep them exposed because we're seeing that that prevents food allergies and i know you mentioned that story of um a parent that you know that mm -hmm. <clears throat> that drove to a hospital to make sure that they were safe but actually that's not really considered necessary um, you're able to kind of do that introduction and that monitoring of uh, the peanut response at home especially if your kid is a, like you know not a high risk person so you know if you're if your child maybe has the eczema and the a sibling or something that has an allergy that maybe you might want to see a doctor about the best way to go about it but if your child doesn't really have any of those risk factors go ahead and do it at home i love peanut butter peanut butter is like a really important part of life i feel like it's it's, it's like PB and J sandwiches, mm -hmm. like almost represent childhood. Exactly. Like, is there any food that represents childhood more than PB and J sandwich? Also, just think of like chocolate and peanut butter. No, chocolate and peanut butter. Oh. Okay, I would say PB, like peanut butter and chocolate. That's probably the top flavor combination on the planet. Like a hundred. I dare you to come up with a better flavor combination. I 
Totally agree. I totally agree. So all my peanut allergies. You want to challenge us on that? Put in the comments. <laughs> What is the best food combination? So, you know, the guidance we talked about, about that early introduction for peanuts, um, that is specifically for peanuts, because I know, at least in North America, that was like one of the most common food allergies and the one that produced anaphylaxis the most often. But we just really don't have enough evidence to show that this works for things like eggs or other allergens. So we just talked about what parents can do with their children as you, you know, start introducing solids and stuff. Uh, but maybe we can take a step back and talk about what pregnant people can do while you're pregnant. Which is so interesting just to think of like what you do while your baby is in your utero affects kind of the outcome of your child later. And I know we know this. And that's something that we're learning more, more and more about. Interestingly, there's some evidence that taking an omega-3 supplement while pregnant might actually help reduce the development of allergies in your child. And we see that especially in the first three years of life for your child uh, with all sorts of allergies and with food allergies specifically, it seems to lower the risk of allergies for the first 12 months. And I wonder why the effect is go goes for that long, but then also stops right at that 12 month mark. So I think more and more research really needs to be done there and like kind of figuring out what the mechanism is. We also uh, have seen studies into, you know, the entire diet of the pregnant person and how that affects the child's allergies afterwards and you know this is not really a surprise but having a healthier diet pattern so having foods that are richer in vitamin d so that's like things like fatty fish um which also tend to be rich in omega-3s as well um having foods that like a lot more vegetables and the like that also um reduces the risk of developing allergies in the soon to be human being. Um, and you know, there's there's not too, too much research in the area, but I think that that's definitely somewhere where we're gonna see more, um, more research in the future. Research also shows that people that drink a lot more milk during pregnancy seem to, you know, their, their offspring tends to have a much lower risk for developing cow's milk allergy. Allergies don't necessarily show up straight away. And there are things that you can do once your baby is born to reduce the risk of allergies, you know, as they get older. So we talked about the recommendations for early introduction of peanuts, but there's also some other, you know, general guidelines that may help reduce the risk of your child developing allergies. So one of them is just having a healthy and varied diet, you know, things like including a lot of fruits and vegetables. And you know, things like fruits and vegetables, they have a lot of things in them that may actually feed uh, and help foster the bacteria in your child's gut that may help reduce the risk of developing allergies. And that also fits into the hygiene hypothesis that we talked about earlier. We also see um, that children who are breastfed tend to have a lower risk of um, developing a, a food allergy. and fits right in to the hygiene hypothesis because, you know, when um, babies are breastfeeding, they're exposed to the bacteria that's on the skin and that helps populate their gut with different types of, of bacteria, which is quite interesting. We also see that introducing fish in the first year of life um, can help reduce your risk of developing all allergies as well. Which is, is quite interesting and you know we, we talked about omega-3 earlier when it comes to the maternal diet but I wonder you know fish in the child's diet is that because of the omega-3s? Is it because of the vitamin D? I don't really know. Excellent questions and I'm sure there'll be more research to come. That is the 411 on allergies. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. Thank you for watching. Bye!